Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Hello, this is Bruce Hugh, the lock artist. Yes, Mr. Hugh, thanks for calling back. I want to let you know I was in town. I'd like to get together with you if you have time to see me. Why, yes, I just got out of court, and I have a meeting in a few minutes. It shouldn't take long. Could you meet me at 5.30 for a drink? Sure, any place you say. All right, there's a place called Todd's, right around the corner from my office on Spring. I can find it. This is quite a mix-up, Mr. Yule, the uh, Lockhart's being killed like that. Yes, it is. Are you any closer to learning which one died first? Uh, we are not. It was a matter of only a minute or so. Yeah, it's only a $200,000 question who lived those couple of minutes. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing. Delicious. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Washingtonian Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Horace Lockhart matter. Expense account item one, $8.90, fare and incidentals between Santa Barbara and Los Angeles. Your Los Angeles agent found that I was on a case in Montecito and saved you some $200 in fare from the East Coast to Los Angeles by bringing me down from Santa Barbara. At 5.30 that same afternoon, I met Mr. Bruce Yule, attorney for the Lockhart Estate. You lead off, Mr. Dollar. I'll answer any question I can. So far, I know the bare facts. I tried to get some information from the police, but everybody told me to call some other office. You must have called the local authorities? Yeah, shouldn't I have? Mr. and Mrs. Lockhart were killed in county territory, so it's under the jurisdiction of the sheriff. I was way off then. I was almost up to the highway commissioner when I quit. Well, we have a fairly complicated system here. The Lockharts were killed on the coast highway, north of Malibu. They were returning from a visit to Santa Barbara, when their car was either forced off the road or went out of control. Crashed through a guard fence and over a bank. What time of night was it? It was about two in the morning. Now, the actual report was phoned in by the operator of an all-night garage on the highway. But the man was notified by a young woman. She said she had seen the accident happen, had stopped, and gone down to look at the car. But that's where our information stopped. Yeah. Am I right that she did tell somebody that one of the Lockhart's was still alive then, but that she didn't say which one? Well, that's correct. That's what she told the garage operator. Uh, his name is Gallagher. Yeah. And the whole thing hangs on this girl. What's been done to locate her? Well, we put ads in the classified sections of all the papers. It happened only night before last. I'm certain she'll call in before long. I hope so. How often do you look at the classified section, Mr. Yule? Well, certainly we can hope that she has friends she's talked to about the accident. And even if she doesn't see it, why, somebody will and tell her about it. The man in the garage. You said his name is Gallagher? Yes, Patrick. Thanks very much, Mr. Yule. I think I'll rent a car and go out and see him. You Mr. Gallagher? Yeah, that's right. My name is Dollar. I'm an investigator for an insurance company. I'd like to talk to you about that accident the other night. Uh, that Lincoln with a man and his wife? Yeah, the Lockhart. Oh, that was a mess. We should get him on this highway. Crazy fool drivers. Uh, he was quite a big shot, I read. He was. What I want to find out about is the girl who reported the accident to you. I don't know anything about her. She busted in here all excited and told me about it, and then she left. Never saw her before, and I haven't seen her since. What exactly did she say? Do you remember uh, what do you mean? I'd like to learn her exact words if you remember them. What's so important about her? We're looking for her. I'll explain it to you. 
But do you remember what she said? Uh, well, uh, not her exact words, maybe. She told me about the accident. She said there were two people in the car, and she said one of them was dead, but she thought one was still alive. Can you be sure that she didn't say, I think the man is still alive, or I think the woman is still alive? No, I don't think she said that. Did she say there were two people in the car, or a man and a woman? Yeah, I'm not sure. I didn't think anything about that. All I was thinking was calling the police. As a matter of fact, uh, I was asleep. She woke me up, shaking me and talking about it. It took you a couple of seconds to come to your senses then, I suppose, huh? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, she left and I called the police. But it's just possible that she might have mentioned the man or the woman still being alive. Well, yeah, maybe before I was awake. I... Well, I don't get it. Well, what difference does it make? It makes a $200,000 difference to one of two people, Mr. Gallagher. What are you giving me? You carry life insurance, don't you? Yeah, all I can afford. Well, the Lockhart's each had a policy naming each other as first beneficiary. But each of them named a different second beneficiary. Holy, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm beginning to see. Mrs. Lockhart had named a son by a former marriage. So if she survived her husband in that crash, even for a minute or so, she became his beneficiary for that length of time. If that was the case, her son is in line for the money from both policies. If she died first, it's the other way around, and her daughter by Lockhart is in line. Oh, I didn't think they cut it that fine. You can see how important it is for you to remember exactly what this girl said. Well, knowing isn't going to make it any easier, to be sure. I'm not sure, that's all. What did this girl look like? Well, I'll give you a little more help there. She, uh, she had blue eyes, and it seemed to me she was wearing an awful lot of makeup. You know, it was really plastered on. You couldn't really see her skin. Like stage makeup? What about eyelashes? Were they false? Yeah, yeah, they were. Now that you mention it, they were too long to be real. What else? Uh, well, she, uh, she had a scarf over her hair, but I'm pretty sure it was blonde. And uh, that's about all. She's wearing a coat. Oh, and I noticed when she left, she was barrel-legged and wearing white shoes with high heels. Her legs were tan, so maybe she lives on the beach around here someplace. Could that have been makeup on her legs, too? I don't know. Maybe it was. What about her car? What kind was it? What color? I didn't see it. Didn't see it? No, she parked there by the side of the building where you did. Uh, when I was on the phone, she pulled out and headed toward L.A. It sounded like about a Chevy or a Plymouth, something about that size. Yeah. Well, thanks, Mr. Gallagher. If you think of anything more, I wish you'd call me. I'm at the Homeby Hotel on Wilshire. I'll leave my card. I drove up to the scene of the crash about two miles farther north. The Lockhards couldn't have picked a better spot. There was an almost sheer drop of more than 20 feet to some big rocks just above the beach. The rocks still showed the marks of the impact. At the sheriff's station on the way back into Los Angeles, I saw their photographs and heard their theory. The car hadn't been forced off the road. The tire marks it left made it appear that either the driver had fallen asleep or that the crash had not been accidental. The next morning, I was summoned by Bruce Yule to the Lockhart address. I found it at the end of one of the elite roads in L.A.'s prize subdivision, Bel Air. It was guarded by an iron gate, and the mansion itself was evidently a replica of something Italian. I was told to wait for Mr. Yule in a domed entry hall. Well, thanks for coming out, Mr. Dollar. I uh, wouldn't have missed it for the world. Yes, it's uh, quite a place, isn't it? I wanted the children to meet you. Do you know about them? Only that they're half-sister and brother. Yes. Michael Adams stayed with his own father. Never has lived here. He arrived from Seattle last night. And this is the first time he's met his stepsister. That's Gail Lockhart. Yes. She's uh, 23 and he's 27. Well, uh, I wanted them to know we're doing everything we can to find this uh, perverse witness who's become so important. Why doesn't she reveal herself? I wish I knew. Well, uh, Oh, uh, this is Mr. Dollar, the insurance investigator who has come out to help us. Uh, Miss Gail Lockhart. How do you do? Miss Lockhart. And Mr. Michael Adams. Oh, hey, Mr. Dollar. Nice to meet you, Mr. Adams. You uh, both have my sympathy. Oh, I think Miss Lockhart deserves it more than I do. I'm no more than a stranger. I don't even remember my mother. She and my father divorced before I was two. Oh, stop it. Sorry. Mr. Yule, I don't have to stay, do I? May I go to my room? Why, yes, Gail, if you want to. I do. I can't talk about it anymore. Huh. I'm sorry, but uh, I feel like I should explain my place in this. Uh, I know I don't belong. It's I... all right, Mr. Adams. Gail is terribly upset. She was in Santa Barbara with her parents that night. She was supposed to drive back with them. 
They've been drinking heavily, and she begged them to stay over. And when her father refused to do that, uh, she refused to ride with them. Hmm. I didn't know she was with them. Well, you know how these situations are. She's full of self-incrimination. Can't help feeling she should have done more, like take the keys to the car, or even call the police, or something. Well, what are we going to do about this witness, Mr. Dollar? Maybe you can help us, Miss Adams. Do you ever read the personal column in the classified advertising section of your paper? Personal column? <laughs> Hardly ever. Have you any idea when the last time was? Oh, months back, anyway. I think we have to do better than that personal column, Mr. Yule. Spot a few small ads through the other pages. Have you contacted any but local papers? Uh, no, no, not yet. Just because that garage man told us her car headed for L.A. is no proof that she's here. She might have passed right on through. Uh, yes, but a girl driving alone at that time of night... We have no reason to think that she was alone. Gallagher didn't see anybody else, but he didn't see the car either. There are people who just don't like to get involved in things like this, you know. Uh, yes, yes, that's true, isn't it? Uh, what would you say to posting a small reward? I think that would be a good idea. Not a reward for the information we want, because we'd get too many cranks who would say anything for money. Say, that's right, isn't it? I think we should offer the reward for any information that will lead us to the witness and print the description Gallagher gave us. Uh, that's a good idea. Sure is. But I'll go call my secretary and have her compose an ad and get it into as many evening editions in the county as possible. And San Bernardino and Riverside counties as well. Excuse me. Golly. This suspense is really something, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I know I don't deserve any of the money. Why, you could have knocked me over with a feather when I found out she had me in the policy. Oh, I suppose she always felt bad about the way she deserted my father and me and wanted to make it up, huh? That was probably it. But, man, 200,000 bucks. If I get that, I'll be sitting on top of the world. I wouldn't spend it yet if I were you. Oh, I know it's a toss-up, but sure would be justice, wouldn't it? With all she'll get anyway, Miss Lockhart doesn't need it like I do. Why, from the looks of this place, she probably wouldn't even miss it. Maybe you're right, Mr. Adams. She probably won't miss anything but her parents for quite a while. Uh, sorry. Can't seem to say the right thing around here. The practical Mr. Adams had to wait along with the rest of us. The second day, the reward was increased. It was increased the third and the fourth day until it stood at $1,000. There it stayed for fear somebody was sitting on the information and watching the price of it go up. A few newspaper and radio reporters played it up on the mystery woman angle, but the actual $200,000 question we wanted to ask her was never let out. We had some worthless reaction, but on the seventh day, we got what we figured was our first break. An apartment house manager phoned Bruce Yule, and I went out to talk to her. <laughs> Well, it's not me alone, Mr. Dollar. A few of my tenants have mentioned it, too. We're all curious about this mystery woman, you know. Uh-huh. Well, this is Tuesday, and that awful accident happened a week ago Sunday, didn't it? That's right, Mrs. Brewer. To be exact, about two Monday morning. Well, at 10 o'clock that morning, one of the girls who'd been living here left with almost a whole month's rent to live out, Susan Lee. Oh, would you say she fit the description in the papers? Now, that's why I decided to call. We'd share the reward, but I'd do the talking, because... Especially the theatrical makeup that was mentioned. Susan was a dancer in the naughty 90s nightclub on Santa Monica Boulevard. A specialty dancer, as she put it. Did she own a car? Uh, that was another thing. The ad mentioned a Chevy or a Plymouth. She had a Plymouth. It's very interesting, Mrs. Brugger. Did she say where she was going? Well, she said she'd found a better job in another town. But when I asked her where, she changed the subject. She was hiding something. Made no arrangements for mail? Well, I asked her about that, too. And she said she'd come back and pick it up as soon as she could. I think she was in trouble. Has any mail come? Well, nothing much. A couple of bills. This one today. Former photographer. A photographer? That might really help. Why, yes, yes. He must have taken a picture. Let's see the return address. Oh, wait till I tell the girls. Oh, I hope it's her. Why, well, I never even knew anybody who ever won a reward before. It was her. As a matter of fact, things developed quite nicely for the next hour and a half anyway. At the garage, Gallagher positively identified the girl in the print I took him from the photographer. So at that point, that's what we had, a picture and the name of our witness. The rest of it wasn't so good. It looked like she'd taken a sudden run out for reasons and places unknown. With a seven-day start, she could have reached almost any place in the world. For 
for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. A lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift. Helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. And now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we bring you the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Very much, does it? No, not yet, Mr. Yule, but it's more than we've had. One thing I'd like to suggest. Yes? I think we should leave the reward ads running just as they are. Oh, uh, you don't think we should get right to the point and add her name and photo to the information? No, not right now. If she's running away from something, we might drive her farther if we did that. I think we should go on as if we haven't learned anything. Oh, yes, yes, I suppose you're right. In the meantime, I'll see what I can dig up. Santa Monica Boulevard Club, where Susan Lee had worked, was open but almost empty at three that afternoon when I went in. Just the bar was in operation, but a series of larger-than-life-sized posters on the wall promised entertainment nightly by outstanding personalities of the dance. I found the manager in his office. What was the name again? Dollar. The bartender told me where I might find you, Mr. Cobley. I'd like to talk to you about a girl named Susan Lee. Well, what about her? Uh, come on in. Come on. I can spare a few minutes. Thanks. You, uh, you a cop of some kind? Private one. Why? You expecting some? No, not especially. Except the way Susan dropped out of sight all of a sudden, and the way you come in asking about her. What's up, anyway? I was hoping you could tell me. I'm working for an insurance company. All I want with this Lee girl is a statement about an automobile accident she witnessed. Hmm. Oh, hey. Is this what's been running in all the papers? Yeah. We've been trying to find it for a week. And it's Susan? That's right. <laughs> what a dope that makes me. And a lot of other people around here. Uh, are you sure? A guy identified a picture. Why didn't I think of that? You know why? Because the papers gave the idea that this dame was coming to Los Angeles from some town up the coast. That's all we know, that she was driving south. How could Susan be driving any place up there at two in the morning? Her last show here was a quarter of one. I'm more interested in knowing where she is now. I take it you don't know. No, no. A contract had another week to run, but she called me one morning a week or so ago and said she was sick and could she quit. Is that a Monday morning? Well, I can find... Yeah, yeah, sure it was. She called me at home. We're closed on Mondays. Hey, I think I got something for you. What? Well, uh, one of the other girls picked up a pay for her. She wanted to quit, she told me, and I don't make any trouble with the girls who want to leave. And then she wanted Lamine to pick up her check. Well, I said that'd be okay if she sent a note authorizing it, and she did. This, uh... What did you say? I mean? Well, yeah, that's a stage name. You know, these girls get those monikers legalized when they're too young to know any better, and then they're stuck with them. Uh, Lamine Dunn. <laughs> you can tell before you see her that she's brunette and specializes in tassels. Would you mind giving me her address? Uh, no, no, I've got it right over here. Susan must have some hot dough to be worth a thousand dollar reward. I wish I could tell you, but I can't. It's worth plenty. No, I wasn't pushing for information. Uh, yeah, here it is. Uh, the Wesley on Wilcox. Good. Thanks very much. Oh, sure, sure. I don't care what you don't tell me, but anybody could use a hunk of that reward these days. I'll remember what you've done, Mr. Cobley. We'll see what we can work out. Thanks again. Sure. <laughs> I suppose you've read the papers like everyone else. I'm the insurance investigator who's looking for that girl. She turns out to be Susan Lee. Oh, well, come on in. What have I been sitting on, anyway? You know what we want her for. Because she saw that wreck. But don't you know what could have happened that made her leave town like she did? No, don't you? Well, I know there was... Look, I'm going to sound like a pretty lousy sort of friend, I suppose, but I only met her when she booked into the club. We happened to get along, that's all. I don't think that's the kind of friendship where you find that greater love hath no man stuff. Besides, she didn't trust me enough to tell me everything. Everything about what? 
Why don't you sit down? Thanks. I promised her I wouldn't say anything, and I haven't. But now you want to know, and I'm not going to lie about something I don't know. That makes sense to me. Something happened to her that night, and I think it was over that guy she married. You'll have to remember that I don't know anything about her. Oh, yeah. Well, she married this guy. I never met him. His name's Robert, she told me. They ran off a couple of months ago, got one of those quick Mexican jobs. You don't know where this Roberts came from or lives. All I know is it must have been a dandy marriage. She still lived in her apartment, and maybe once or twice a week she'd leave after the last show and run up the coast and meet him. She said he traveled a lot. And I believed it, but not the way she meant it. She sounds a little naive for her profession. No, she isn't. Uh, wasn't. I guess everybody really takes a fall sooner or later. But she came here that night, or morning, I guess it was 3.30. She still had her stage makeup on. She said something happened. She had to get out of town. That's all she'd say. She mentioned seeing the accident? No, just kept on saying something happened, something awful happened. She had to leave town. Could she have caused that accident? The police say no other car was involved. Oh, then it must have been that husband. You know his full name? Yeah, it was Phil. I heard her say that. Philip Roberts. It's probably a common name, but we'll get on it. You talked to her the next day, you know, about her paycheck? Yeah, she phoned me, and she told Mr. Cobley she was sick because she didn't want him to ask questions about why she was leaving. So I went down and got her check. I met her in a drive-in joint on Santa Monica, and the same thing, and making me promise not to tell anybody. Do you have any idea where she might have gone? Yeah, I have. Where? Once a week, every Sunday, Susan used to get flowers. She used to say they were from some masher in San Diego. She'd tear up the card and let the flowers dry up on her dressing table. A bouquet came that Sunday night, and she didn't even unwrap it. It was one of those what's-the-future nights for me. <laughs> I was figuring how many years I had left in the racket, wondering what had made me go wrong with the way I spent all the time I'd been in it. Well, I was real gone. When Susan left, I took her flowers and brought them home, and I read the card. It said, as usual, if you ever need me. That's where she's gone. Do you know, or are you guessing? Both, I guess. I met one like that when I was Susan's age. That's where I should have gone. Maybe she did. I still got the card with the name of the florist on it. San Diego is some 120 miles from Los Angeles. But when I opened the phone book and saw how many Philip Roberts there were to be checked, the trip seemed short. I didn't get there in time that night, but the next morning I located the florist. He had no trouble remembering the man who so faithfully sent flowers on Sunday. At noon that day, I found Robert's house, and I recognized the girl who opened the door to me. Yes? Susan Lee? No, no, she isn't here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, leave me alone. Go away. Get, get your foot out. I didn't know. I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't know. Let me in, Miss Lee. You don't have to be afraid. All I want to ask you about is the accident you saw last Sunday night. No, you're lying. Let me in. You're lying. I read about your reward in the papers. You tried to trick me. How did you find me? I had to find you. I didn't do it. I didn't have anything to do with it, no matter what she says. You're saying things you don't have to say, Miss Lee. No, I'm not, because everything else you've heard is a lie. What lies have I heard? Who lied to me? I don't know. Don't you think I've spent all night long every night hearing what she said to you? But I believed him. I believed everything he told me. Philip Roberts? That's not his name. I know it isn't now, but I married him. You think I would have married him if I'd known that he was already married? I guess you'd better tell me about it, Miss Lee. I thought I was married to him. We went to Ensenada. Some man married us down there. It was in May. And I thought he was my husband all the time. I was going to quit dancing and we were going to go away. And then Sunday night, I heard them. You were north of Malibu Sunday night? Yes, he rented the cabin for us. But when I got there Sunday night, there was another car. I left my car and walked to the cabin, and then I heard them. She called herself his wife, and she used a different name. She called him Carl. I don't know why I listened. I wanted to run. But I stayed and listened to them argue. And found out that I wasn't married to him at all because she was his wife. You don't have to tell me this. Yes, I do. You have to know the truth. I heard her say she'd kill him. And then I left and started to walk toward the highway. And I'd gotten almost to it when I heard the shots. I wasn't near the cabin. I was almost to my car. Miss Lee. When I heard them, 
Oh, I thought I was running away because she'd shot him over me. Where is this cabin? It's about three... You know where it is. You've been there. You found him. As far as I know, no one has been there. I haven't heard anything about a shooting north of Malibu. You're lying. No, I'm not. But we'll have to phone the police to check the story. You're lying. You're still trying to trick me, but you can't. Stop it. You're lying because you believed her. Let go of me. Let go. I didn't do it. I was running away. <laughs> It took some time to digest it. I called the police and saw Susan Lee on her way back to Los Angeles with them and then called Bruce Yule. By the time I had driven back, he'd spent a half hour with the girl and gotten the report of the police who visited the cabin. I was called to the lockout home for the second and last time, and together with the two prospective beneficiaries, I heard what the lawyer had to say. Oh, it's a pathetic story. This man entered a bigamous marriage contract with Susan Lee. His first wife followed him to the cabin. She didn't know about the marriage, but she suspected something. At the height of the argument, she shot him and then turned the gun upon herself. Miss Lee was afraid to surrender as our witness. They're both dead? Well, I'll uh, be... Yes, but actually, that's none of our concern now. This tortured girl did witness the accident. And in spite of her own problems, stopped to give what aid she could, which, of course, was none. <laughs> did you get a statement from her, Mr. Yule? Yes, I'm afraid I did. Before a notary public... Susan Lee swore that the person who was alive at the time she viewed the wreck was Mrs. Lockhart. I knew it, hot dog. Shut up. Make him stop. <laughs> Get him out of here. I can't stand it. Oh, here, can't. here, now, here, here. Let me take it to you. It's, it's really true? Yeah, I guess it is, if you'll say so. Man, $200,000, and for what? For being born to the right mother. That's what I call profit on a small investment. Yeah, I guess that's right. Two hundred thousand. Why, I bet I can invest that and live like a gentleman the way I've always wanted to. I wonder how much this house costs. Nothing like this in Seattle, but I might show them a thing or two. Expense account item two, $356.50 miscellaneous in Los Angeles. Item three, $218.45 transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $583.85. Remarks, as far as I'm concerned, the money went to the wrong beneficiary. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment any time, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, always keep delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen starring in the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were Howard McNear, High Averbeck, Barbara Whiting, David Young, Virginia Gregg, Eddie Marr, and Mary Jane Croft. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum every day. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns in another adventure of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>